The wheel of time turns and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend, then fade to myth. In one age called 2022, a TV show recently concluded. The season finale of the show was not an end, as there are no beginnings or endings in the wheel of time, but it was an ending, an ending of the hopes of many. For it shall come to pass that what men made shall be shattered, and the shadow shall lie across the pattern of the age, or in this case, the TV adaptation of The Wheel of Time. Many fans of the books watch their beloved story become corrupted by the studio execs at Sheol Ghoul. When fandom is heartbroken by the breaking of a fantasy world, how can the forces of the light fight back? This is Fantastical Truth, the podcast from lorehaven.com, where we explore the best Christian-made fantasy, science fiction, and beyond, and we apply the meanings of these stories to the real world that our author, Jesus Christ, calls us to serve. I'm E. Stephen Burnett. I published lorehaven.com. I'm also the co-author of a nonfiction book about fiction called The Pop Culture Parent. And I'm Zachary Russell, or today, Zach Althor, and this is episode 95 How can we fight the shadow when it breaks the wheel of time and other fandoms? And we'll be joined today by a special guest, Gregory Shane Morris. Gregory Shane Morris and Zachary Russell are the only hosts of the show right now that can explore (laughs) the wheel of time. Uh, As with my discussion earlier with Shane Morris, uh, just last month, actually, uh, we left Zach out of there. We just shoved him into the cupboard under the stairs because he's not (laughs) part of the Harry Potter fandom. But I knew it was going to be fair. All things will circle back eventually, and now they're the ones uh, celebrating the Wheel of Time TV show, or are they? And I'm the one in the cupboard under the stairs, or the Dragon's Dungeon, or whatever it is in the yeah, we'll, fantasy world there. We'll, we'll open up a traveling gate and drop you off at Tremel King. You know, there we go. Away. Thank you. Thank you for injecting the jargon there. Like <laughs> I, I somehow, like don't, don't at me, folks, but I completely missed this massive Jordan fan base, but I do feel their pain. And if you like me are outside of this fandom, I want you to feel their pain as well. Uh, (laughs) This is something that Christians do. This is proper empathy, Zach. Like, you know, this is not the bad kind of empathy. Uh, We need to be empathizing with the struggles of our brothers and sisters who look at what these studio execs at Shagol Ghoul, I'm mangling the pronunciation probably on purpose, close enough. Yes. Looking at what they're doing, to y'all's beloved fantasy world created by the late Robert Jordan and finished off, I think, by Brandon Sanderson. And we're going, what are you all doing? Why are you subverting the themes of male and female and destiny and all of these things, even while, as you and Shane will discuss in just a moment, uh, carrying forth some of the not so great themes of yeah. Robert Jordan's famous epic? Oh, man, Stephen, th- this uh, this fantasy has been part of my life for most of my life. Discovered it in high school, read it through a little bit in college and, and afterwards. Uh, even found it when I lived overseas, believe it or not. I, I found it at a uh, like just one of those open air markets when I lived in Asia. Um, so that was that was very surprising uh, to find it there in English. And um, I went, went through an ebook phase for a while and I'm, I'm on my, I don't know, fourth reread of the, um, at least the first book that I just finished. Th- this wasn't a series I talked about very openly, I guess, because 30 years ago, not everyone talked about their fandoms the way that we talk about them today. And there, there weren't necessarily these big online communities, you know, where you choose your Harry Potter house or you choose your, you know, wheel of time character or whatever. Um, I, I guess it's the influence of role-playing games. that's really brought that out. But uh, today, I'm 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 definitely going to reveal how much of a nerd I am for this uh, story, and uh, and yes, I, I can spell everything. Now, the funny thing is, I can't always pronounce everything. So your your pronunciation is not much worse than mine because I am a reader of this series. Shane was a listener, so Shane knows exactly how to pronounce everything, but I know how to spell everything. So ah, I'm happy okay. with that. Okay. Yes. Uh, again, I'm unfamiliar with this, but I can feel the pain uh, of you and Shane. Mostly because, especially in this past week, uh, for me as a uh, Wobegon member of the DC Snyderverse uh, fandom, yes, we had our giant victory last year with the release of the impossible pipe dream movie, Zack Snyder's Justice League, an epic four-hour superhero meta extravaganza. But very clearly after that, the studio decided to just poo-poo the notion of getting sequels to these films or doing anything more with them and just completely denigrating the fan base by saying 
Y'all got a little too excited about this one. We've got some other very nice, shiny pretties in the back room for you. Yes, yes, aren't you a good little fan? And we felt very patronized. Mm-hmm. And now they're releasing all kinds of cheap-looking promotional shots and completely canon-breaking nonsense from all the other shows and movies they have planned. And it is genuinely heartbreaking. You know, you feel disrespected. Uh, you feel like they do not care for the story and the characters you feel abandoned and you feel like they've unfairly and punitively, uh, even with malice disregarded the amazing work of artists and actors and producers and writers uh, in favor of something else. And the something else, you know, that may be good too, but you don't know why should you get invested after they have just completely trampled the interest that you had in the previous uh, version of the story. Yeah. And what's really weird with wheel of time is to see this massive, astroturfing campaign happen on on reddit and social media and fans like me that have loved these books for decades are getting denigrated as book sworn uh which is a reference to dragon sworn which are these like radicals in the, in the story that are like these radical the devotees of uh the drag yeah the, the studio execs have spent quite a bit of money paying for all these trolls or whatever to uh try to sh- shut everyone down that's complaining about this it's very odd to watch this is like a keynesian artistic economy here where you're just you're just trying to make things happen by force of will and money and power rather than letting them develop naturally from the free market of fan interest. Uh, Might have mangled an economic metaphor or two there, but that is how it strikes me, is is an effort by the powerful to force down a product that a majority of the fan base in this case, uh, not just you and Shane and others, uh, clearly are not as interested in. I'd be interested to see if they get a season two for the show or what the fallout will be now that it's included. Yeah, it's already been greenlit for a season two, but... uh... You know, headline the other day was the Wheel of Time is bleeding viewers uh, the okay, further it went wow. on. And so we'll see what season two does. Uh, I already have a number of friends that have said, nope, not watching any more of it. And they, they stopped. Some of them stopped at episode four. Oh, and, you kept uh, going. You, you were fair. I, I kept going. Oh, they're yes. not going to get rid of me. <laughs> well, you at least want to hate watch it, if nothing else. And I understand that. Uh, mm-hmm. However, wouldn't it Try make not sense? <laughs> wouldn't it be kind of wise to stop watching and, and then not? not give them the the credit uh you do have other yes. things to do other fandoms that actually care for you you know the marvel fandom frankly the uh, the producers are very responsive hmm. to even the most niche of fan requests and several fan casts have come true and recently you had all kinds of a nostalgic respect for all of the previous spider-man films in the new movie uh, spider-man no way home that's not my favorite version of Spider-Man, but I respect him, Tom Holland, and, and those that version of things more uh, because clearly they respect the other iterations of the character. And when you have creators who don't respect it, then all the respect is lost. Uh, the purpose yeah. of stories is lost. Uh, the magic is drawn out of it, and the shadow corrupts all that it touches. Before we get into that, uh, let's touch on our sponsor, the first sponsor for this episode, once again, is the recently opened Lorehaven Guild. It's a Discord server exclusive to free subscribers of Lorehaven. Uh, we are exploring not the Wheel of Time, uh, but the story that was my favorite growing up and so far has not been corrupted by studio execs, at least not too much. And that's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's our first book quest. We started it uh, Saturday, January the 8th. And as of this episode's release date, we will be exploring chapter nine of C.S. Lewis's classic fantasy, but it's not too late for you to join and enjoy this first of many book quests at the Lorehaven Guild. All you need to do is go to lorehaven.com in your email address. You will get subscribed to our updates and you will also get the super secret access code to enter the guild. We have a faith statement that all the guild leaders uphold. We have a code of honor that every member of the guild must follow. After that, you are free to explore, join book quests, uh, join this burgeoning community of Christian fans of amazing Christian-made fantasy, science fiction, and beyond. Lorehaven.com slash subscribe to join the Lorehaven Guild. All right, well, let's head over to the concession stand, or in today's case, the Wine Spring Inn. Now, the Wheel of Time is not uh, explicitly a Christian fantasy like we are used to reviewing here on the podcast. Um, the author was a Christian, or at least he went to church. And so there are definitely some Christian themes in the story. But, you know, we just have to say up front that the books and definitely the show contain a lot of ungodly elements. There's adultery, polygamy, tons of violence, and there's magic. And we, you know, we've talked about all these topics before. There's profanity, but it's actually um, 
like an original profanity to the story. So uh, alternative Christian curse words, if you will. You know, this is a side quest, as we say in our Lorehaven Discord server. Yes, side quests like the uh, excuse I made last year to do a Zack Snyder's Justice League episode or any other episode that touches on a secular fandom. Uh, We're not going to be a generic, you know, Christian geeks exploring popular culture podcast. We want to focus on the best Christian made fantasy we can find. But for fandoms like this that break out and have bigger themes to explore, we're always going to make room for those kind of topics as well at Lorehaven and on Fantastical Truth. Like I said before, the only other concession I would offer is that I'm unfamiliar with this fandom. Uh, if you are the same, I'm not familiar with the Jordan verse or the Wheel of Time verse or whatever the actual fans call it. Randland. Translate. Randland. Okay, there we go. Just translate all of what Shane and Zach are saying into the fandom of your choice and resonate with their emotions and moreover, try to harness those emotions for productive ends. There are ways to enjoy even a corrupted story sometimes, uh, but I think better is to allow the corruption of this story to make your heart groan for Christ's redemptive story, where he follows his own canon, where he ties up all the loose ends. Christ, having created the roles of men and women, will respect those. He will not subvert them. He will not subvert your expectations unbiblically, and he will reign over a fantastic world full of his magic, his supernatural wonders, and no one will ever be disappointed by a plot twist gone awry ever again. Amen. Thank the light. Well, I hear Shane Morris approaching on Bella the horse. So let me go outside and help him uh, tie up the reins and bring him in for the interview. All right. Shane Morris is a repeat guest on the show. So I guess you're a friend of the show now, Shane. Uh, He's a senior writer at the Colson Center and host of the Upstream podcast, as well as co-host of the Breakpoint podcast. How are you doing, Shane? It's great to meet you this time because I wasn't able to join you and Steven last time to talk about Harry Potter. We played hooky last time, Zach. It was was a good conversation. Um, (laughs) And I'll I'll say I'm really excited to be a friend of the show after only you know, one appearance, but if that's, <laughs> if that's what it takes, I'll take the, I'll take the rank. I think that's how it works. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier about how you, you live in Florida and you, you go scuba diving and you find these giant shark teeth. So, so tell our listeners what, what are these teeth that you find and what's so significant about them? It's the second most interesting thing about me after <laughs> the woman I'm married to. Once you meet her, you won't want to talk to me anymore. She's way more interesting, but the uh yeah i like to go scuba diving i got into it partly because i'm you know a florida native so florida man make all the jokes you want (laughs) and then partly because i've always loved fossils ever since i found a shark tooth uh fossilized shark tooth in my parents driveway as a kid and uh, i got into scuba diving because i realized that the best fossils are underwater especially the the sharks and megalodon has become like a a cultural phenomenon recently because the jason statham movie right um but, but, uh, and they're definitely gone, but there are some fossil beds in Florida North Carolina, um, Maryland around the Calvert cliffs area. And I've hunted all of those and they all are, they all kind of bear and preserve these giant teeth up to some of them. The world record breakers are like uh seven and a quarter inches wow. slant, slant wise. And to put that in perspective, I mean, you can pick up a pretty good sized book and that's the cover of that thing. I mean, that, yeah. that would cover most of this book I'm holding. So yeah, they're, they're massive dinner plate sized things. Not all of them were that big, but it was the biggest shark that ever lived. And their fossils are preserved in quite readily in a lot of sediments and you can go scuba diving and find them. Well, in certain parts of the country, you're not allowed to have a knife with a blade that long. And so that that's just terrifying to think of a giant animal swimming beneath you with those for its teeth. Uh, good thing they're not around. I'm I'm so glad that the uh, the flood or whatever it was t- <laughs> took these things out and and uh, we don't have to worry about. It's probably more boring than that. It's probably the later the isthmus of Panama closed okay. and the global ocean was cut in half and then they couldn't they didn't have any food anymore. So that's the theory at least. Well, you're a braver guy than I. I I love to swim, but uh, scuba diving uh, well it doesn't really work for me with my ears, but it just also terrifies me to go under the water. <laughs> Uh, that deep. And so, uh, so we'll just uh, do something a little safer today and dive into the Wheel of Time books. And yep. we're going to talk about how they became a show and you know, what our reactions are to that. And uh, 
to our listener, you know, if you're a, if you've watched the show or if you're a fan of the books or you've done both, uh, we really want this to be interactive. And so, uh, we, we'd love to hear from you, Shane, let's talk about the books. So I, I know from talking uh, previously, you, uh, you're an audio listener yeah. and, uh, you listened over this series over a, a few years, which is really cool because you know, the pronunciation way better than I do. I just, <laughs> I just read the physical books. And then eventually, actually got the the ebook, which is like one entire ebook of like something oh, wow. like a, like two million words or whatever, a hundred thousand or oh, ten thousand pages. Oh, I think it's pages. way north of that. I think yeah. it's actually uh, so four million four, words, four million ish range. Yeah. yeah. And then now I've got hardbacks. I I used to have the really crummy like um, what do they call them? The mass market paper paperbacks. So. Mm-hmm. And with these being, you know, 800, a thousand pages, it, it was almost a cube. <laughs> like yeah, it was almost right. as thick as it was wide. It's like, I've, I've still got the paperback goblet of fire and that one truly, it, it doesn't even mechanically work that well because the, the covers are soft and it's like this just brick of paper. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, it, it's sort of like uh, bragging rights, you know, you get through right. a story this long in whatever format it's like. You know, you've invested time in this. You've spent years of your life with these characters going through their journey. So my first question for you is, who are some of your favorite characters in the books? So I, I think I'm in a minority in really enjoying Nynaeve Almira. I think that she is, you know, you saw the, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a meme, speaking of the, um, you know, audiobooks versus books, there's a, a meme. It's like Godzilla versus King Kong and and Godzilla is labeled uh, audiobook listeners who know how to pronounce the names. And then King Kong is labeled book readers who know how to spell the names. And they're just sort of, you know, <laughs> fine. but I think Nynaeve, um, who has a weird spelling for her name, is right. one of my favorites. She's the, the wisdom of Emmonsfield. She's known for uh, her protectiveness over the three, you know, young men who are kind of candidates for the, the dragon reborn early on and who follow Moiraine and Lan out of, out of the two rivers. And she, uh, she's one of the youngest ever wisdoms. A wisdom is kind of like a soothsayer herbalist sort of character. And she's very self-conscious about it. And she's got this braid that marks her a woman and she's always tugging it. You know, Jordan has her constantly, (laughs) all of his characters have some kind of mannerism or tick that they do and, uh, or a lot of them do. And hers is pulling the, tugging the braid when she's agitated. Um, but something about her I I enjoyed it was her uh, her stubbornness her indignation her sort of her sort of sense that um, the world order is not right and she's not going to cooperate with it uh, and she's going to fight for what's right even if she has no clue what she's doing there's a pluckiness and uh, valor there that I really enjoyed and then the the way she stood up to Moraine coming out of the two rivers and says you know uh, well, okay you're going to take my the kids out of this this uh town i'm gonna go with you to make sure that they get back safe and it was just it was like that you know no it wasn't like she doesn't ask permission yeah (laughs) right and it wasn't like in the series in the amazon series where she like disappears for several episodes but yeah she's one of my favorites i think that anybody can say randolph thor the dragon reborn he's fascinating um in his own right but i didn't really i don't think i really liked him between like books three between like the stone of tear and veins of gold on dragon mount you know in the in the penultimate book um i don't think i liked him in that span because he's so angsty (laughs) and the messiah figures often go through this angsty dark night of the soul and he boy was he in that for a long time (laughs) so uh let's see i'll list one more i think uh bail doman you know the ferryman is is a lot of fun he's he's a fun character but i gotta say out of the big three you know, Matt is the one that sticks out. I, mm. I, I, I found, you know, um, Matt from Cawthon. He's like the, he's like the, uh, he was Andy Samberg in my head. He's, <laughs> he's always like, yes. in, he's always into total mischief. He's got a smart mouth. He, he always has that Marvel worthy quip, uh, whenever something bad is happening. Um, and he's, and he's a gambler. He's got a lot of luck. And he's a, you know, he's a, he's a ladies man as well. So there's something Jack Sparrow esque mm. about him. There's something that you like about those scout. He's a Han Solo character, right? Mm-hmm. He's a very scoundrel character, but then he turns out to be this repository of all the ancestral memories of the people of Manetherin. And he's got all this great wisdom. You know, he's, we can talk about the mythological 
correspondences and the char- the echoes in the characters. But he is obviously an echo of Odin in Norse mythology. There's all kinds of little little tells on that. So I think those three characters are the ones that stand out in my mind as favorites. You know, you, you give me an interesting thought here, which is that I ask a lot of people this question that are readers of the books, like who's your favorite character? And you're right. Like so few people actually say Rand. I mean, it, it's an right. easy one. It's kind of like, you know, if you could go back in history, who would you meet besides Jesus you know, or besides <laughs> C.S. Lewis? It's like, okay, of course you got to like Rand. But I mean, he does definitely go through this very dark period over multiple books. And, um, and he's carrying this heavy burden of the fate of the world. But in some ways, he's like the most straightforward in his portrayal and in, in what he's trying to do. He's a very interesting guy. But it's almost these side characters that are more interesting and fun. And you're right with Matt. He's definitely the, the spice of life in the books. And it's so many characters like that are, are funny, are, they're quippy, and that's what gives the book its flavor. Like, you know, people say, well, how in the world are you going to read 14 books? And it's like, well, it's actually 15 because there's the prequel. And right. it's because so many of these characters are just great. They're hilarious. Or they're, that was the uh, thing, yeah. So I don't really sympathize at all with the the whole this is a long slog I can't get through it attitude because now I can understand that if you're reading like the Summa Theologica or something it, the nonfiction that is really long is a slog that's right. difficult to stay you know stay with but these characters to me you know and this goes back to whether I'm I'm reading um, a print book or listening to an audio book it's just, it's kind of the same for me. These characters uh, and this story are like a refuge that I could go back to whenever I wanted and just sort of unhinge from my world and my concerns and step into this other world. And that's, you know, it's that classic escapism thing. But I think there's a redeeming way to be escapist as well as, as Christians. And so Wheel of Time became this other, it was a bit like a, 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 another life. There was this little side life that I had that I could step into. And it emotionally affected me too, you know, as the big turns of the story happen, I come out of it and I realize, wow, you know, I, <laughs> I'm kind of really upset right now because of the way, you know, Cad Swain is treating Rand. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and then I had to do check myself. But then at a certain point in the story, you realize where it's going and it, it just becomes so cool. You can't, you can't put it down or stop. I don't understand the whole slog thing. It was, I, I had this feeling. In fact, this is why I started Wheel of Time was because I asked for recommendations on fantasy stories a few years ago. And people said, well, you know, once you've gotten out of uh, uh, Tolkien and Lewis and, you know, you move beyond the Inklings, you can move to some of the newer stuff. And people said Brandon Sanderson, people said, um, you know, a few other names. Then Robert Jordan was thrown out. And of course, you read Sanderson anyway by reading Jordan. But I heard that it was 15 books long. And I was like, well, wow, okay, this can solve my problem with my last fantasy series, which was, um, I think it was Andrew Peterson's Wing Feather Saga. I like mm-hmm. blazed through that real quick. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I just didn't want it to be over. I wanted, mm-hmm. to, I wanted it to keep going. And, and I thought, here's a series that will just keep going. You know, this is going to last me a good long time. This is a meal. And um, so I, you know, I, I did that and I kind of savored it. When I got to the last two books, I'm thinking, oh no, it's, it's almost over. What am I going to do after this? I still haven't found a, a replacement really. <laughs> That's so true. You know, I am totally that way of like, I don't want a good story to be over. And I, I am infamous for getting to the end of a book or end of a series or end of a TV show and just kind of waiting a while until yeah. I like kind of close that book and and or just close that off on my watch list just like oh i i just don't want it to end because then where am i going to go next and you can obviously get buried in the nonfiction for this book this book uh or this book series has two or three different like encyclopedias Mm -hmm. you can read through uh i've been reading through those uh you know the other uh thing about these books that are so gripping is there's so many life lessons in this and uh so my my favorite character is probably perrin um, yeah. Perrin has been described as the, the moral conscience of Robert Jordan. And, um, and I didn't really understand that until recently. I learned some stories from Robert Jordan's personal history of being a Vietnam vet. And so you, you know, you can imagine the sort of horrible things that people went through in the jungles, but, but in his case, it, it was the, um, 
the stories of not just suffering violence, but committing violence, like, like mm. in the cause of the war. And uh, the kinds of things that he's, uh, he had to do are, are pretty awful, but it, it was more so like who he was becoming. And uh, people called him the Iceman because he just, just dealt out violence without any thought uh, like any moral repercussions. And so, you know, it, in the books, Perrin is kind of that character that, that's wrestling with, you know, what, what is the good of violence or the good of use of force? And there's this great line in the eye of the world, book one, where uh, he meets this other character that becomes a mentor figure. And this is another big meta theme of just positive male mentors. Is that Elias? And, uh, Jira? Elias. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so it says Perrin raised the ax to throw it in the pool, but Elias caught his wrist. You'll use it, boy, and as long as you hate using it, you will use it more wisely than most men would. Wait. If ever you don't hate it any longer, then will be the time to throw it as far away as you can and run the other way. Oof, goosebumps. Right? Oh. I mean, just, just such a great perspective on life. And I, I've talked to some military veterans about this quote. I'm like, do you think this is a good... And, you know, so many of them have said, absolutely. Like, this is exactly how I look at, you know, whatever it is, if it's guns or if it's whatever kind of weapons, uh, you know, and being in Texas where gun culture, I had my own moment of really wrestling through that about 20 years ago. And it, it was really this perspective from the books that sort of gave me the right way of thinking about it. Yeah. Um, because he's like a gentle giant too. Yeah, exactly. You know, temperamentally, he does not like to kill. Right. And he does, and he's very careful with everything he does too. In fact, people, he says that people mistake him for being slow or simple because he takes such time before he says anything to make sure that he's going to say the right thing. And he considers his actions carefully too. And he's like that, you know, that peaceful blacksmith, um, but he's called on to exercise violence. And then he realizes, of course, spoilers, he, he realizes that he has a, a certain affinity for, you know, a very violent and vicious animal species you know he mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. he's a wolf brother and um and that plays into his whole personality so yeah Perrin's a great Perrin is the most morally upright of the three uh two mm -hmm. rivers boys for sure yeah and it's probably that how he, he thinks very carefully before he wants to say anything why i like him because i don't know what i'm thinking until i say it and then often it's too late <laughs> to take it back because i'm just very much an external processor <laughs> was that a michael scott quote that sometimes i'll start a <laughs> sentence and i don't even know where i'm going <laughs> Yeah, so sometimes we like these characters because they're so different than us, and then yeah. other times because they embody things that that are similar to us or that what we like. You know what you said about Nynaeve, I I can totally understand that. Women in Texas, particularly the women in my family, are very very similar to Nynaeve, yeah. and and I mean that in a good way and in, in a respectful way. But it's very much that gumption and independent streak. And with with certain women in my family, it was out of necessity. It was who they had to become mm. uh, with the circumstances they were dealt, and so. I like that the whole background, you know, all the main characters in the story come from this same village where, you know, stubbornness and, and just, uh, stick to itness or whatever it is sort of what defines them. And they're just, they're too stubborn to, to let the shadow take over the world. You know, they're, they're, they're often very stubborn in like really petty ways, but, but they have this sort of long suffering, uh, that becomes such a great theme to think about. You know, it reminds me where, um, where it says in the epistles, I do not grow weary of doing good, you know, because so often the Christian life is that it's just simply enduring and persevering through just the, the slog of living in this world that we have to sort of have that internal stubbornness. So I'd be curious to know what, what are some of the life lessons or kind of the, the bigger themes that you've really liked in this, mm. in this series? Well, to, to answer that, we really need to answer the question of what the wheel of time is about. I really love answering that question when it comes to any story. And I think the Wheel of Time is really about, um, it's really about the dynamics between genders. And that, that may set, strike some people as, a, as a, like a subordinate theme, something that emerges in the story, but is not the main theme. I think it is actually the main theme because if you look at the reason for the central conflict in the story um, that was introduced in the Age of Legends, you see it in the prequel or the uh, prologue to the Eye of the World, which is uh, which sees Ishmael and Luz Theron having their final confrontation and the formation of Dragon Mount and Luz Theron's death, and the reason that Luz Theron is having this confrontation with the head of the Forsaken is that he's mad, he's lost his mind, he no longer has 
um, his sanity. And the dark one, this primordial chaos being, has done this to him by tainting the male half of the true source or the one power. Um, and it is, it, it's called uh, Zydeen. And this happened because Luz Theron led a company of men, male channelers, Aes Sedai, to try to imprison the Dark One, but he didn't work with the women. He discounted their contribution to the whole thing. He thought just the men could do it. And when he did that, the Dark One was able to strike back because of that weakness and taint the male half, driving all male channelers insane and causing them to be you know, murderously destructive. And that broke the world. And so the background to this is a gender conflict. It's having left women out of the picture, not having worked together with them to be d- you know, dominion bearers and creators. And so you enter this weird world in the, in, in the main character's timeline where women are the only ones who can channel. They're the only ones who can use this, the magic system of this world. Well, that immediately invites a question. Why? What's the deal? And then you find out there are these men who pop up every so often who can channel and they are feared. You, they're terrified. Uh, people are terrified of them because they are in, in doomed to go insane. And so the White Tower, the Aes Sedai, the, the, the main female channelers of the story, one of their main jobs is to go around the world and they have a whole branch called the Red Aja that's dedicated to gathering up men who can channel and basically making them go away, you know, in a, in a mafia esque sense, they don't kill them <laughs> directly, but they do something to them that makes them just want to die. And this dynamic is the one into which the main character, Randall Thor, the, the hero emerges. And he is a man who can channel. And he is the, he turns out to be the prophesied, you know, Messiah figure who was the reincarnation of the man who made the mistake. And as the story progresses, you realize that he has to he has to reclaim the mantle of male channelers and he has to lead a whole company of male channelers to fight the madness and to reclaim their abilities and then ultimately to uh cleanse the male half and to fight the dark one together with the women and the resolution of the story involves this fighting together this joining up with men and women together both using their power to um to defeat evil so I, I give all that background to um, of what the Wheel of Time is about to sort of summarize why I think that the the gen, the interplay between the sexes, but the the gender dynamic there, is central to Robert Jordan and something that I I love about his story. Um, you see this in the the way characters kind of play together in the sandbox of his story, the way they're constantly like quipping at each other about. There's all these these little things about. Um, characters, not uh, the male characters are like, I don't understand women. I don't know where, <laughs> why are women the way they are? Or, I wish I understood women the way Rand understands them. And then Rand's like, I wish I understood women the way Matt understands them. And, <laughs> and Matt's like, I wish I understood women the way Perrin and Rand understand them. I mean, it, you know, nobody understands women. And then the opposite <laughs> side, the women are kind of, uh, they have this ongoing frustration and, and mystification about the men. And you really get, you, you kind of get to see things from their perspective. And they they're concerned with things like well naive you know she's concerned with things like well why can't people just um why can't people get over their stupid politics and their stupid games and just you know fight for what's right and and respect one another and uh, why do men always have to go take stupid risks that they don't need to take you know she she has these these tensions i think are realistic portrayals of a of a female character's motivations and Jordan shows that they are very different. The men and women are not the same in his story. Uh, at any level, they're very distinctive. And you even see this in the, the magic system. The whole point is that men and women draw from different wells. They draw the one power from two different wells, Sidene and Sidar, the male half and the female half. And those two halves have their distinctive characteristics. And they're both, they're both necessary and important. So I think gender um, and the, the celebration of masculine and feminine is my favorite theme in the wheel of time. There are, there are lots of other really good ones, especially Mm -hmm. as you get to the climax of the story, but that's the one that stands out to me as like the central theme, you know, and speaking of naive there, you know, she's a healer in the story and and she plays a critical role in the development of this whole story. Um, and that is so true in that she sees these problems and is like, how can I fix these problems? 
you know, she gets exasperated by people being, you know, stupid or wool headed or whatever. You know, she has all you these wool headed cu- lummox. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sheep brained or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, she sees this central problem as something that can be solved and she wants to be part of solving it and, and she does. And that, I think, is what, what I love is very similar is that this story is, so some people have described it as the battle of the sexes. And it's just these stereotypical men and stereotypical women and all these kind of bad stereotypes. Or some people have said, well, it's a really good portrayal of toxic masculinity, that word everyone loves oh, now. And then other people would say, well, it's really a story about radical feminism and how women are running the world and ruining everything. And, you know, I like those are such like narrow slices of what it's about. It really is about, you know, the complementary nature of maleness and femaleness and the good of both masculinity and femininity. Yeah. And, and how, how they bad are different. They become yes. when they're separated from each other. Right. When the dragon's fang and the flame of Tarvalin are not nested within each other in the ancient symbol of the Aes Sedai, they're both symbols yeah. that to some extent excite dread and resentment in people because they really do go off the rails on their own. Yeah. I think it's so interesting that instead of putting a, you know, a swastika or some other horrible symbol on people's doors, they put a dragon's fang, you know, the, the black part of the, the yin yang symbol, uh, where the, the point is at the bottom. And basically this is a way to mark out someone as a dark friend or accuse someone of being a dark friend and, basically call someone evil and invite harassment on them. And, and the show even uh, gives us an example of that. But it's so interesting that, you know, this symbol didn't used to mean that. Like it, it used right. to just mean men. It just meant male channelers. And it was next to the female channeler one. And you're right in that when they grow apart, you know, these, they both become toxic actually. But what, um, what I particularly love is that, yes, it's a story where, it's basically a, a matriarchal world and, you know, men go crazy and, and kill everyone when they, when they use the one power, but this isn't saying something, um, about men themselves or masculinity itself. It's saying there's a problem that we need to solve that, that, that men and women need to be a part of solving because men are going to be good in this world. Like men are not inherently evil. Um, now it does show very clearly like maybe not total depravity but it it definitely shows like men and women both have their dark sides and it's very honest about how we fall short of the glory of god but it's also very hopeful about what men can become that men can become good and this personally resonated with me a lot because i read this as a teenager i went through a lot of stuff in my childhood that i'll just say it really showed me the dark side of men Mm. and so i could i could totally relate right away that man, there's these really dangerous, crazy, evil men in this world that have already destroyed the world and could destroy it again. And so that unfortunately resonated with me because of what I went through as a kid. But at the same time, we have these male mentor figures like Elias that I mentioned, or there's Lan who mentors Rand, or there's Tom who mentors Matt. And there's many, many other ones that, you know, take these young boys under their wing and, and really show them like, this is how to be a man. And it's, it's a very positive portrayal of manhood in, in some. Uh, so to me, that's what I loved that it, it's like, it's not giving up on men while at the same time being very honest about where men go wrong. Yeah. I, I don't understand people who say that wheel of time is, you know, either patriarchal or or feminist or or whatever the both sexes are portrayed in all their glory and shame i mean there mm. is there are there are very good men and there are very bad men there are very good women and there are very bad women and jordan has fun with the uh, the stereotypical foibles and weaknesses of of each but in the end that message of the sexes being complementary and necessary for um, each other's thriving is loud and clear. I mean, the fact that Rand cannot even fulfill his mission without the help he has, he ends up enlisting from these female characters. Um, it makes it clear to me that Jordan was doing something other than, you know, parodying or caricaturing or even just having fun with the foibles of each. He was actually pointing us to the complementarity 
of the sexes and the ne necessity of the two. And the fact that this legendary historic character, this personage, Luce Theron Telamon, um, the prior incarnation of Rand, failed the way he did. Um, and has to go through his own journey to be sort of reconciled with himself in Rand uh, is is proof that that you know his mistake couldn't be repeated that women have to be included men have to be included and that they have distinctive roles and that's I think one of the things that irritates people is that um, Jordan does in the end portray men as having an initiatory leaderly um, almost patriarchal role and he portrays women as having this. Uh, this uh, glorifying role and, and enlarging, beautifying, maturing, and glorifying role in the in the magic and so the great, like he says, the greatest works in the age of legends. How were they done? They were accomplished through a cooperation between men and women. How Zidine uh, cleansed through a cooperation with men and women. Um, it's just it's just real clear throughout, and I love that. Yeah. I've just found a way gate back from Tremel King in order to introduce sponsor two for this episode. Once again, we're going from fantasy to science fiction because it is T E Bradford's novel awakened full of killer robots made good. Here's the book description. What if your worst enemy was your only hope? What if saving your life meant destroying your beliefs? How far would you go to survive? MACs manufactured anodic commandos were designed for battle. Most people believe sending robotic soldiers into combat is better than risking human lives. But Kara has seen what happens when unfeeling soulless automatons decide who lives and who dies. Machines don't care whether the enemy is holding a rake instead of a gun or that a six-year-old girl watches from a bedroom window. All they know is what they were programmed for, destruction. When Kara finds herself wounded and defenseless in the middle of a battle zone, she has no choice but to use the only weapon she can find, a disabled MAC. Without him, she won't make it out alive. With him, she might come out a different person. Will hate destroy her? Or will the natural love of a creator for its creation open her eyes to a truth that changes everything? You can find Awakened from T.E. Bradford at Amazon. See the full book description and the cover and the purchase link at lorehaven.com slash podcast sponsors or the show notes for episode 95. Well, now let's uh, let's go into the blight a little bit and talk <laughs> about the uh, where the shadow fell over the series uh, through the TV adaptation. Oof. And man, oh man, th this was uh, th this was you know to use the language of the book, this was sort of the breaking of the world uh, for book for a lot of book fans, you and I included here. So we're probably going to have a lot of similar uh, grievances, and and that's why I wanted to start this episode off by talking about what we love about the series, because it's mm. it's because of what we love, the show just wounds us, <laughs> just grieves us. Going back a couple of years, when I first heard about this series getting an adaptation, I was so ecstatic. There were some warning signs that I just kind of ignored or didn't even notice. So I, I've been a fan of the series for since the early 90s, and book fans have been talking since there were message boards online about how in the world would they adapt this for TV? Because like everyone yeah. realized, is this a really long series? But also, it, there's so many characters, there's so many locations, and it's always been this um, question mark. And, the, and also the fun things like, well, who would play this character and who would play that character? If I could sum up the grievances I have with this show in, in just a single thing, it's that they've taken the soul of it, as, as one of your friends uh, commented on, uh, when we wrote about this on Facebook, they've taken the soul of this and altered it. So they haven't simply taken the story. Everyone kind of knew that the story would have to be condensed, things would have to be adapted. But uh, your, your friend Seth commented and said, uh, what, what they've done is they've altered the soul of the series to fit the expectations of people who don't enjoy Wheel of Time. Yeah. And uh, there's this infamous quote now uh, by the showrunner of this uh, TV series. And he said, I'm a feminist and it's very important to me that the show is feminist in today's context. So a lot of those things will be changing. Well, and, and what are those things that he's talking about? It's, you know, the rigid gender division, the troubling aspects, you know, the, the problematic aspects of the gender binary. And so that that probably forms the foundation of what is different between the books and the show. Yeah. Um, and it's, I don't know how, where this is going to go, but that, uh, would you say that's, that's about yeah. right? 
Me neither. I mean, there's so much, there's so many other things to complain about in the adaptations. And I think a lot of them are very worthy complaints. But Seth is right that the central issue with this adaptation is it has cut the heart out of the story, not just in a, you know, kind of thematic sense, but in a mechanical sense for Pete's sake. I mean, it, I had another friend, uh, John Arrett, observed uh, a, a while back when I posted about why I didn't like the show that they have literally taken the central conflict the, that kicks the plot off, which is that women run the world through magic, men can't use it, or they go crazy. What's up with that? Why is that the case? Well, Jordan explains it very clearly, like we just did, that there was a a mishap that resulted in the dark one wrecking the male half of the one of the one power and inhibiting male use to the point where the world broke uh in this story they've pretty much done away with as best i could tell the, this adaptation they've pretty much done away with the distinction between sidine and sidar the male half and the and the female half of the one power and they keep referring to it just as the one power now there's like a there's kind of a paradox. It's almost like a hypostatic union thing going on mm-hmm. in Jordan because it's the one power, right? Well, it's only one, but it appears to be two, and that's you know kind of explained with the drawing from two wells. The men and women access it in different ways that are um, indicative of their natures. But the sto- the the Amazon ad- adaptation just keeps referring to it as the one power. And the problem is they still show men as a persecuted men who could channel as a persecuted and hated group, but they never explain exactly why, what's the, why do they go mad? What's the problem? If they're just using the same thing that the women are using, they don't make that distinction and in not making it. Um, and then in doing one other thing that really annoyed me, they have broken down that distinction. And the one other thing is they implied and said endlessly in the first few episodes that the dragon reborn the reincarnation of Luz Theron could be a man or a woman, it could be a boy or a girl. That Moiraine, uh, Rosamund Pike's character, says it again and again that this could be either, and that this is an understood part of the prophecies, that there is no gender determinism on reincarnation, that Luz Theron could come back as a girl. What? There's no, that's not anywhere in the in the mythology. And that ruins the whole thing because if the dragon comes back as a girl what's what's he going to draw on he's going to draw on the female half which is no problem but the problem in the story is that a man needs to fix the male half so i mean it, it you know it sounds like i'm going on a, a nerd rant but in reality you get you get how if you care about the story at all you realize how central what i'm saying is and the fact that they decided to sort of smudge that out of existence raises huge questions for the audience about why exactly things are working the way they are and I'm sure they'll try to retcon it at some point, especially if they get as far as like the cleansing of Zidane. But I don't, you know, I don't know how they how they work through that. And the implication that the dragon could be a, a, a girl, even though they didn't, apparently they don't do that. <laughs> that would be pretty crazy. But even if they don't do that, the fact that the Aes Sedai think that's a possibility mm-hmm. is just, bleh, mm-hmm. it doesn't work. Well, you know, I, I've been seeing the show now as a subversion of the books and in particularly this aspect of the two genders being different and, and that there is a gender binary, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know how, you know, the showrunner talks about in today's context. So what do we see in today's context? Uh, we, we see this idea of there is no gender binary and unless, right. unless there is, because I, I don't know how you have things like transgenderism without a binary, but okay. and this idea of gendered souls is mm. apparently problematic. And, you know, as a Christian, I, I took a step back for a while when I, when I first read all this, cause I'm like, well, okay, I don't believe in reincarnation. Like that, that's not consistent with the Christian worldview. Sure. So, you know, I don't buy into that aspect of the story, but what I do buy into is that, you know, Jordan is basically espousing part of the Christian worldview, which is that body and soul go together to make a person. You know, the, the Christian worldview doesn't, doesn't say, well, your, your soul is female and your body is male or, or vice versa. I guess that's where the show is trying to go to, to sort of support the idea of transgenderism in this world. Yeah. But it's, you know, th- what the show is doing is, is basically inserting a philosophy from 21st century America <laughs> into the story that takes place 
thousands of years in the future. So it's it's actually kind of funny to me that he uses this phrase in today's context, you mm-hmm. know, not yeah. not the ancient context of 1990, but but you know, we're so enlightened today and I'm like, but this story takes place thousands of years after you've died. So actually yeah. you're the one living in the past. But regardless, I I think they're trying to make that work. And, um, you know, th- th- this has been a problem with a lot of movie adaptations lately is that there- there's this very particular way of looking at life, a way of looking at gender that gets put into these stories where it, it doesn't really belong and it changes everything and it's not needed. And ultimately what I think the show is trying to do is make this commentary of there's actually no difference between men and women. Well, except when there is, and, and the women are all the awesome, you know, powerful ninjas or whatever, but otherwise there's no difference. And, um, while at the same time trying to be feminist. And so, you know, I, I think it's just kind of eating itself alive is, is sort of like the, the symbol of the snake, you know, eating its tail. I think that's just what's really going to happen with this. So, yeah, I tend, I tend to agree with that. It, and it's, it is frustrating to watch because we, you know, fans have waited for so long in this, this universe, this, this nerd verse. Uh, for an adaptation of this because adaptations make make fans of a of a fantasy series that uh hardly anybody reads um i know it's got millions and millions of fans but like individually it feels like there's nobody else i can talk to about this Mm, it makes us feel seen and noticed right Mm. it makes us feel like lord of the rings fans had this when the when the you know 20 years ago when the fellowship came out it was like hey everybody okay that thing you're really excited about it's been the thing we've been excited about for our whole lives and you haven't listened, but now you're listening because there's a cool, nifty, highly produced movie coming out that, you know, adapts it. And I think that like the, the fellowship of the ring and the Peter Jackson trilogy. Um, I know that some Tolkien fans object to aspects of it, but to me, it was a masterclass in like faithfully adapting the spirit and meaning of a story uh, in a beautiful way that just just honored the author with everything they they did. I mean, it was I recognize that they could have been a little more faithful to the book in in some aspects, but that was a great that they did a great job with that. Um, this is like there's so much to complain about it, and not just beyond what we're talking about. Everything feels on the nose. Uh, honestly, there are moments when there's a kind of feminist point made or a, or a gender neutral point made or something that feels very modern and progressive. And I just feel like I'm watching a Kirk Cameron movie or something. Like it's a, (laughs) it's like a bad Christian movie where they're just like on the nose. Here you go. Here's our agenda. We're just going to put this out here. And then they make land cry as much as they possibly can, you know, (laughs) because he's got to have a sensitive side. He can't be a, he can't be a stoic stone. And it's a, at a certain point you just like, why am I, why am I wasting my time here? Yeah, you, you can start predicting what's going to happen. Yeah, you can. And uh, well, and you know, this is a bit of a spoiler for the the final episode, which I know you 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 couldn't make it all the way through. You didn't watch, dude. I I gave up at the lesbian <laughs> sex scene. I can't. I can't do it. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, that that was and that was very forced and and very actually directly against what Jordan himself has said. He he directly said they're not lesbians. Yeah, they're not lesbians, and we should be those two clear, characters. We yeah. should be clear that Robert Jordan is not C.S. Lewis. Okay. He, no. <laughs> his his story does have same sex relations. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, particularly female. There's a whole concept that you know women are kind of gay for the stay at, at the White Tower, yeah. and they call it pillow friends. But and when Warren and and um, Suan are identified as having had that kind of relationship, but the key point is that he's d- denied that they're actually lesbians in their orientation. That that they recognize what they did as kind of like a you know as an aberration from who they were. And both women go on to marry men. Men. Yep. So it's, you know, it this this introducing that as an active adult relationship mm-hmm. was just such a slap in the face. And I mm-hmm. and it also ruins the awesome friendship that they have in the story, which is this very underground sort of um, surreptitious. Like we're gonna we're we're moving and shaking the world, but the, these two know a big secret because they were there to hear the prophecy of the dragon's birth. And they kind of pacted to never tell anyone, but to search him out so that the, you know, the fanatical Red Aja wouldn't get a hold of him and gentle him before the, the last battle. <laughs> yeah. Now there, there's a, um, uh, we'll, we'll get into Reddit in a minute later, but um, 
th- there was this uh, Ask Me Anything with the showrunner on Reddit, and he rev- or actually with Brandon Sanderson, and oh. um, and Brandon Sanderson talked about how who, he's who given, finished who for the record finished the books for right, Jordan after he died right because uh, he he died at book. 10, I think, and then, mm-hmm. uh, or book 11, and then and yeah. Sanderson took the next three. But uh, Sanderson was saying that, you know, through the development or the kind of the pre production, the development of the script, he would send uh, the showrunner a bunch of his notes about what he was seeing in the drafts, but also the studio was sending hundreds, if not thousands, of notes. And so, um, so on one hand, he's sort of getting this kind of gentle, you know, hey, let, let's try to stay true to the story and the meaning of the story. I mean, that's that's really the, the key thing is how the meaning keeps changing. Yeah. But also the studio was putting this pressure to, I would guess, to over-sexualize a lot of things because yeah, we do see that in the show. Now, again, this is this is a story where there is uh, there is there's sex, there's nudity. There's polygamy. Yeah, there's polygamy. Sure. There's all kinds of adultery. and. But I could think of um, another book with some polygamy in it that yeah. we all like <laughs> <laughs> right but it's it's sort of um t- if i can use the word tasteful like there's usually a fade to black it's not that's exactly right yeah i don't think it's ever graphic um it's ne- it never is in fact jordan i mean he makes a point of that if you if you yeah. just read through these scenes it's like yep uh that was a fade to black i mean we just sort of yeah. pick up afterwards he doesn't give any graphic details it's fa- it contrasts very sharply with some writing of someone like George R. R. Martin, who you yes. know talks about where the body fluids splash and stuff. Yeah, and I think that's what the studio had in their mind of we want the next Game of Thrones, and so yeah. we're going to just take everything to the next level. And uh, Jordan uh, famously uh, legally went after uh, erotic fan fiction that people were posting on the internet. Wow, I, I learned this recently that apparently he has a very long history of doing this, and it's. Uh, uh, a lot of people that were writing it or posting it or enjoying it, you know, kind of got soured from that. And it sort of caused this little schism, I guess. I I don't know. I don't know how big the erotic fan fiction community is, but apparently a lot of people remember that on the, uh, the message boards. Um, who, but, who was uh, leading that Grandall? <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. She's the character in the story. That's like the, uh, the hedonist, uh, the forsaken. dominatrix. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So again, you know, those elements are there, but it's not, um, it's not in your face and it's not, um, uh, it's not graphic, but it, it's honest. You know, it's like, this is how people are, you know, this is, this is how they really are, especially the evil characters. But, um, you know, a, a big part of the books that I love is that there's all these rules, you know, this is what people have called hard magic system and uh, versus uh, the soft magic system where it's kind of more like a fairy tale. And I'm not totally all that into fantasy. I mean, I've only read a few other, uh, you know, uh, series of fantasy, but uh, apparently this one is the kind of the front runner for that style of there being almost a science to the magic mm-hmm. and that everything has its limits. Um, there's a YouTuber, uh, that I've really enjoyed called, uh, it's books and Bianca. And she said, you know, the problem with the show is there's no rules for anything. Yep. Everything happens for fake tension or cheap thrills. Um, and that's exactly it. You know, that there, there's these characters that suddenly learn the most powerful channeling, you know, spell that's, that's ever existed to bring someone back from the dead. Mm-hmm. And, and that is something specifically in the book that people can't do that. There's a character that tries to bring uh, a small child back from the dead after she's tragically killed. And it's actually very horrifying. Like it, it's sort of like if you just reanimated a dead corpse with like a, um, you Puppet know, strings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or just like pumping oxygen and blood and it would, yeah, the body would be quote alive, but the person would still be dead. Yeah. And, and, um, and, um, Moiraine is shouting, stop, Rand, don't do yeah, this. You know, the right. whole time. Wait, did they, so they, do they actually like violate that in the, in the show? They, they totally violated that in the season finale. Oh yep. brother. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so it, it's the, sh- it's the show not understanding wow. that the limits, uh, that were in the books were, were good things and it, it made for better drama. You know, it, it, uh, the fact that there's all these um, lost talents. So this is the other interesting thing is that this series is almost like a dystopian because it comes after this age of legends when, you know, magic just do all these incredible things and there's, there's flying cars and, 
mm-hmm. all kinds of cool things. But but now all that's been lost. It, it, it was buried under this cataclysm that happened. Um, and you know, one of those things is like teleportation. Like they can just open a gateway and go anywhere they want. But traveling. when they yeah, traveling. But in the in the books, when it, it's like five book five books in, I think when they rediscover that, and um, and that has its limits. You know, th- there's all these different restrictions on even using it. And so in, in the show, someone just does it because they're able to. <laughs> and so oh. th- there's just so many cheats like that, that, um, you know, cheat codes are really boring. Like if you've yeah. ever played a video game on God mode, mm-hmm. it just, it gets old really quick. And um, I think it's. Um, That's what ruined Age of Empires 2 for me was learning the Photon Man uh, ch- uh, cheat code. <laughs> you just make a bunch of those suckers and they defeat the enemy. And it's like, well, what's the point of this? You know, or, or infinite shields kind of thing in halo. Right. It's just like, well, why would you do that? Right. Right. Or infinite ammo or, uh, yeah. infinite, uh, or, you know, regeneration or something like that. <laughs> There's something really boring about that. And, um, th- this has been a, another trend in a lot of movies and in, in television where, and, and it's usually follows a very predictable pattern gender wise is that, uh, the, the men fail and are weak and the women are unstoppable and, and just super powerful. And th- this happens very much in the season finale where Rand is supposed to have in, in the books, Rand accesses this deep well of just pure Sidene and he's able to battle the forsaken and even battle this entire army of Trollocs like all by him. He's it's all by himself. But it's not like he just discovered this power within him. It was left there. It's sort of like this giant battery yep. he's able to use. And um, but what happened? So in, the show completely removes that. He d- he doesn't get to use any of that. And uh, is he the gets green this, man even there? No, he's not there. Oh, the eye of the world is just this uh, hole on the ground, and um, and he's able to defeat the forsaken guy with an object that Moraine gives him. So again, it's that. It's like, take the power away from the man, give it to the woman. And then the Trolloc army that's defeated is because of uh, Nynaeve, Egwene, and these other three random women that link together. And none of these other three women have barely any ability to channel, Mm. but somehow together they're able to defeat an army of (laughs) 20,000. And so it's just like, even by the show's own rules, it's ridiculous. But it's, it's like it's going out of its way. So it's like you said, it's so on the nose to say, oh, women are awesome. Like women are so powerful and men like really stink. And it's just like, I mean, this is, um, I, I've read a lot of comments where women are actually speaking up against this and they're saying, come on, you're not even giving us a fair fight. Like you're handicapping the men and as, as though we can't fight against them. Like that's actually insulting to women. And, um, yeah, about this being on the nose, th- there's been some other a really interesting Reddit thread I read where someone's like, I grew up as a fundamentalist Christian and Wheel of Time mm-hmm. is exactly in that same genre of yep. like propaganda fiction. <laughs> so like I said, yeah, it's exactly what it feels like. It's, it's, this is the moral that you're supposed to take away from this. It's Captain Marvel syndrome. You know, it's just yeah. like, let's, let's make this character so beyond powerful that we literally have to get rid of her for a while in order for a plot to exist for the main <laughs> Avengers story. Like right. that's what they had to do. And that's why everybody hates Brie Larson's character. I mean, she's the least popular of all the sort of Marvel cinematic universe characters. And the same thing happens when you, um, number one, when you, uh, you know, OP the women in a story like this, when you basically make them, make them gods, Mary Sue gods. Um, that was the problem with Ray in, in star Wars was she had nothing to learn. She had nothing to learn in the entirety of that trilogy because she was already awesome. And her conflict as a character was learning how awesome she was and yeah, learning you to are take enough. her own. Yeah, you are enough. Exactly. Mm-hmm. She didn't have to grow like Luke did. Um, and the same thing is true uh, of the female characters. And it sounds like in this adaptation, but yeah. even worse is that rules thing that you talked about. You know, there's um, I think it was Jordan Peterson's latest book, Beyond Order, where he talks about how. Sometimes we do have to step outside of the rules and you know break them. And, and we, we talk, I think I talked about that with Stephen a little bit in the last podcast. But the overarching structure has to be rule based. Rules are necessary in order for a game to happen. I think mm-hmm. Lewis does something similar. Um, I'm trying to remember where. But in, in order for, or Chesterton does it in Everlasting Man, in order for a game to make sense, there have to be rules, there have to be limitations. Limits are how something becomes 
um, meaningful and why you care about something, why you can't just move your chess pieces anywhere. They have to move in a certain way that's predetermined. And that's what ma- that limitation is what makes the game meaningful. The, a plot works the same way, like you were saying. It has to have parameters, limitations, and room for the characters to grow. And Jordan gives the characters that, but I can't, I can't believe it. Sounds like this show is completely taken mm-hmm. away. Like, what are they going to do? How would they grow if they're already Where all Where do they powerful? go from here? Yeah. Does Nynaeve even have her block? No, uh, kind of, but not okay. exactly. It, it doesn't really make sense. It's not, it's not consistent. You know, think of Captain Marvel compared to Superman. Yeah. E- right. Equal power, but what made Superman interesting was kryptonite. Well, that was the only thing that made a plot possible. Yeah, right. <laughs> you, you've got this guy, this, this unpowered regular human, Lex Luthor, who's just clever. Yeah. And he's a, and he's resourceful and he gets kryptonite and he overpowers Superman. And that's a story. And, uh, you know, in the wheel of time, Rand is the most powerful channeler in the world, but what's his limitation? It's the madness. It's the, it's this taint on Sidene where he can't use it safely and he, he's going to go mad and, and who knows what will happen. And that's interesting. It's, it's that limit. So, you know, with, with where this adaptation is, uh, has really gone sideways from the book and, and created what I call a portal stone world <laughs> of the books, which, which is the thing in the books where they go to these alternate realities. That's where you meet land fear. You better stay out of there. Yes, <laughs> that's very true. We, we talked a little bit about how these, how this adaptation has gone wrong, a little bit of why, but how do we respond? Like how, how do we sort of fight the shadow of these invasive ideologies that are, that are corrupting, you know, the the true power the one power of this story like you know do we just do we do we give up on it do we slog through it um what what do you think like what i it, it's a different answer for everyone but what are some ways that we can sort of uh respond in healthy ways to this that's a really good question and it's something that we've had to ask for a number of adaptations now i think the first time i really had to ask this was after i saw the you know travesty that was the adaptation of um prince caspian oh. and then and then the voyage of the dawn treader which was so awful that it was it was literally i mean just unwatchable even if you've never read the books it's just an unwatchable movie um the plot is so stupidly contrived and i, I think in some in some sense you know good art will stand on its own two legs and bad art will inevitably collapse and be forgotten. I, I don't anticipate that this show is going to have long-term viability. I don't know what the, re- what the watching rates and the return on it is, but um, I suspect that people, these flaws we're describing will begin to show up even for people who have not read the books and don't know the story. They'll, they'll begin to ask so many questions like, what, how does this coherently fit together? Why should I care about these characters? And then why should I believe that what you're doing is not just, um, you know, deus exing your way out of every little issue um, instead of working within the sandbox that, that and the rules that Robert Jordan has given you. Uh, I think that sort of will come to that sort of juncture most likely at some point. It's, it's, I mean, it's even true with game of Thrones. It's why uh, for all the complaining I would do about George R. R. Martin, you, you got to hand it to him. The guy, you know, he can write and he knows how to put a plot together and what happened as soon as the 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 head honchos at the uh, HBO ran out of book and wanted to finish the series? Well, it turned into a you know it turned into an absolute mess, and fans of both the books and the ser- and the TV series hated it because it didn't make any sense. It was it was contrived. Um, that's the sort of thing that happens when bad art begins to pass itself off as you know a good story. So I hope that these things will just sort themselves out. We can sit in our little our little uh, time capsules with our um, with our books that we love so much, and then you know wait for another age to to come and <laughs> give and give birth when uh, to to a new set of studio executives and a new opportunity for a cool visual adaptation after after this one has become history and legend and been forgotten and mm-hmm. and so forth. It's funny how many conversations I've had with people about this series where I, I wasn't necessarily like a closeted reader of the series, but you know, and going to high school in the nineties, like you're not really the cool kid if you're reading fantasy. Yeah. And so that, that sort of became my, okay, I'll talk about it to people, you know, in quiet corners or whatever, but I'm not going to be like putting it like a name badge on like, Oh, this is the series I love. 
But nowadays, I think it's really different that people love to talk about fiction and, and fantasy and they're more openly members of these fandoms. And it's the ways that this show has corrupted the books that's made me realize what it is I love about the books. And, you know, and it was your article originally about the celebration of gender that's in this story that made me realize, yeah, like this is a really good portrayal of that. And you know, there, there is some, some real biblical truth to be found here. Now, Jordan, I don't know a whole lot about his, his life and his faith, but I know that he went to an Episcopal church. And so he, he has some kind of background in biblical truth and not real sure um, how serious he was about it, but you can definitely find it in the books. And again, it's like the more we see the corruption uh, of the story, the more we see what it is. There's a great line in the show and I almost can't believe it's in the show. I think this was episode three. It's where Tom is talking to Rand and says, Oh, we call ourselves Gleeman because then that way we don't appear as threatening, but there's nothing more dangerous than a man who remembers the past. Because his whole job was to go around, you know, inns and and uh, and tell stories and and, yeah. and sing songs of what the world was like before it was broken. And I'm like, that's it. That's exactly what I'm gonna do. Like, I am gonna blog my way through this. I am gonna talk endlessly about it, <laughs> and, and not to uh, not to just complain, but to remember and help others remember what was so good about these books. You know, there, there's this other. You, you mentioned Minathrin. Uh, Emmonsfield, where all these main characters are from. And they have this saying, like, we're going to be a thorn in the dark one's foot and a bramble in his hand. And I'm like, mm. that's it. Now, look, I'm not going to go personally after the people behind the show. Like, yes, I've named them or whatever, but but leave them alone. Okay. They're just creators and definitely leave the actors alone. Yeah. I think where the Star Wars fandom really went off the rails was going after the uh the actresses for the characters they didn't like like rose sure. yeah but uh so we we need to stay away from that kind of stuff but i i i absolutely think we can fight the shadow by by calling attention to these invasive ideologies but also pointing to what was so strong and what was so truthful in these stories and then you know maybe pray that someone else picks it up <laughs> for the next season but uh, I don't know how likely that is. Yeah, I hope people are inspired to, I mean, to pick up the books. At that point, you really just have to accept the publicity that a show like this uh, offers the story and direct people to the story itself and be like, here's, here's why I care about Wheel of Time. Here's what I value in it. Here's where it spoke to me. I mean, I can genuinely say that the, one moment in particular in this story, um, God used it in my life to be a, a moment of spiritual revelation. And it was the moment that, you know, Rand overcomes the, um, the madness in him on Dragon Mount. It's called Veins of Gold is the name of the chapter. And, um, and it involves realizing that in order to fight darkness, he doesn't have to be superhuman. He doesn't have to be mm. a stone or a, mm. um, you know, a stoic piece of granite. He, he can actually be human. And in fact, the Dark One's whole strategy to beat him for a long time was to convince him that he had to be a stone and he didn't have, he couldn't have friends and he couldn't have love and he couldn't have, you know, take counsel with those he cared about and he couldn't be a man. Um, but, you know, I was going through something hard at the time and the fact that I could, I realized I could be a man, you know, and then that that's a deeply Christian sentiment that, that God himself in the person of Christ well, weeps, mourns, laughs. Laughter is a big, you know, moment for Rand. The fact that he laughs again, and that's what Cad Swain is looking for, you know, as a sign that he can be, he can be brought through the darkness. And she's like, thank goodness you're laughing again. You know, praise the light sort of thing. Um, I thought you were gone. I thought we had lost you, but you're back. And it's just such a beautiful, mm. <laughs> when you, if people, fans even call that Jesus Rand. After that mm. point, <laughs> he, he, he begins to be Jesus Rand. He's like totally different character. <laughs> because he's overcome that. Yeah. And, and I think the story can do that for people, regardless of whether the, um, you know, Jordan's vision accurately comes through in the series or not. Yeah. Well, that, that's a whole other thing we could talk about, but you know, that, that is such a strong theme in the books. It is, re there, it is redemptive. You know, it is not a nihilistic anti-hero, you know, there's nothing good in the world, darkness. Mm. Um, you know, there, there are all those elements, but that is not, where the story ends up. It, it is a very hopeful story. And as we said, it's a story of friendship. 
You know, it, it's really just, it's the interactions between these characters that, you know, you mentioned Cad Swain and Rand and I can picture it in my head. And uh, now there's a major actress that may play that character in the next series. So she's an actress for the expanse. Uh, and that's, that's a really fun reveal that just happened on Twitter, but the, uh, the interactions, the friendships are so good. And that's the thing I keep finding now is that I I'm finding this hidden fandom, uh, it, among my friends and online. And it's been interesting to see this, uh, this fandom grow, uh, the, I, and I should say the fandom of the books that's kind of suffering through the show. That's like, Oh, I want to like it, but I, uh, it's, oh, it's yeah. just disappointing me. You know, I call, I call on my blog, I have praises and I've groans, you know, like I'm not, I'm not hate watching it, but I am groan watching it at times. And one of the funniest developments, and I'll, we'll end with this because I've, I've hinted at this a little bit is that on Reddit, there's all these, you know, subreddits, uh, all dealing with different aspects of the wheel of time. And there's one particular subreddit that is for the show. It's just wheel of time show. And there were a lot of people going on there to complain about the show, to share all the things that we've complained about, to share all the things I've groaned about on my blog and, and other places. But what was happening was the moderators of the Wheel of Time show were, were banning people. They were kicking them off. So then a lot of these, uh, a lot of these guys, they, they formed their own subreddit called White Cloaks. <laughs> now, the funny thing about that is that in the books, the White Cloaks are sort of this mishmash of the, uh, of the clan and the Spanish Inquisition and, <laughs> and Crusaders, you know, like oh, all yeah. kind of mixed into one and sort of this paramilitary, you know, Puritans or whatever. But um, there's actually some good characters among the White Cloaks. But, but most of all, they're kind of bad. <laughs> and, Tell um, us about it, child Russell. Yes, right. Uh, so they, you know, they they torture people. They they try to root out dark friends, but usually it's just innocent people that they find. And uh, but then the real twist that happened on Reddit is that anyone who commented in the White Cloaks forum, you didn't even have to be a member. If you commented there and then you commented on the Wheel of Time show, they'd kick you out of the Wheel of Time show. And then a lot of people are like, "What? Well, why did I get kicked out of here? I didn't even." break your rules and they're like well we're just preemptively banning people that might say something critical that might hurt someone's feelings or whatever and i'm like wait a minute so you're saying <laughs> that the subreddit for the paramilitary puritans are the actually pro free speech <laughs> yeah. community wow what <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just picturing the blue-haired feminist who must be running this show <laughs> subreddit at this point like it, they're gonna yeah. have nobody left except a bunch of brie larson fans at the end it just Wow. Well, and it, it's, you know, there, there's theories that it's the studio PR department or something like this. And that, that's this whole other weird thing that's happening. There, there's very much this, um, you know, I don't want to call it a culture war, but there's very much this war over perception, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, of this shore. I mean, it, it's, it's part of, it's a cultural artifact now. So of course people are going to fight about it, but there's some other, uh, there's some YouTube channels I've found now, like I mentioned books and Bianca, I meant, uh, there's this one night's watch that I found. Um, and it's, you know, they, they give very honest reviews. They try to stay positive, but I've enjoyed watching these communities grow. Like they're just thousands of new subscribers and, and members of these forums and stuff. And I, I think there is something to be said for that, that, that sometimes, you know, we, we fight the darkness of our angst by finding other people that are also miserable, but, but not to egg each other on, but to say, Hey, what do you remember about this? What yeah. did you love about this series? What, what did you like? Who do you relate to? And how did it affect you? Shane, I loved your story about that, that moment on Dragon Mount. That is, that is really, really cool. I, I can't point to a specific moment about that, but it's just kind of the overall thrust of, of men becoming good that yeah. uh, really spoke to me. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, at the end of the day, it's just an adaptation. I mean, it's just a, it's just a series, um, a TV series. And these sorts of things tend to sort themselves out over time. I, I look back on the Disney, the Disney Wars trilogy uh, on Star Wars and just the consensus that's kind of emerged over time. You don't really see many people out there being like, oh, no, 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 no. The Last Jedi is actually genius and here's why. Mm. It's kind of, the consensus on YouTube and all the reviewers and fans is just kind of, yeah, this one was a big dud made by a guy who hated Star Wars. And then you know, JJ's follow up and attempt to like correct all that was the worst fanfic style, like <laughs> nonsense you can imagine. You know, 
to 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 have to have run a line like somehow Palpatine returned. You know, it's <laughs> it it beat out. She lost the will to live as the worst <laughs> line in all of Star Wars. And yeah, and I think that fans have sort of um, fans who still care about salvaging Star Wars, which I, I don't, I would not count myself among them. But uh, fans have sort of consigned that trilogy to apocryph- apocryphal status. They just kind of looked at it and said, "This trilogy was a dud. It didn't, it didn't care about what we cared about with Star Wars." And I think probably in the long term, if this series continues to go the way it has, fans of Wheel of Time are going to look back and say, "Yeah, that was a that one was a dud. We're not. Uh, we don't really speak of that one or celebrate that one too much." And I'd be very surprised to see it. I don't know how many seasons it's re-upped for, but uh, I'd be very surprised to see it finish the story. Yeah, what what it's made me hungry for is different versions of the same story. So you know, we talked we talked about the audio book on Bianca's YouTube channel. She keeps showing screenshots from, I guess, the graphic novel. That's oh, it's uh, good. Yeah, that, that's like, narrated yeah. as well. That looks amazing. And, uh, and even in Amazon's own, um, prime video app, when you go to the show page, there are these shorts, like these two to three minute short Mm. videos. It's like, um, animated and it's like the background of the wheel of time. And I'm like, man, that, that could be really good. Maybe, maybe what we should do instead of just railing on the live action show, maybe we should start a campaign, a positive campaign to say, we want a wheel of time animation, like just take. Just take the audio that we've already got or, or, or re-record it, whatever, but, but make it just exactly like the books, you know, yeah. just, just bring the books to life through animation. That would be incredible. Yeah. So that's what so, happens with, with Star Wars fans. A lot of, um, you know, a lot of Star Wars fans will look back at the, uh, the Clone Wars series and stuff like that. You know, the animated series based on the prequel trilogy and say, oh, this stuff is like gold. This stuff is better storytelling better character development than anything that Lucas actually did in the prequel trilogy. And it makes us love that, that whole world, you know, and the, that sandbox and maybe something like that could happen with wheel of time. Yeah. Well, Shane, this has been so great talking to you today. Um, it's, it's so fun to find another fan, share the pain, but also <laughs> share the the hope of what this could be. And, you know, and I, I really do share hope that this, this story, these books are going to make another, a positive impact on someone else. And so, if that's you, our listener, it, if if these books are making some impact on you or if, if they've had and you've never shared that, we would love to hear your story. So send us an email at podcast at laurahaven.com and check out Shane's article, The Wheel of Time as a Celebration of Gender. And we're going to link to that in the show notes. Another great way to to kind of process what we've all watched and what we've all read and uh, really just celebrate what God has made in, in men and women. So thanks, Shane, for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Zach. It's been great. Zach, what a fantastic discussion. I'm following most of that, and I appreciate the clarity and the biblical worldview that you and Shane applied to this fandom. We know there's lots of closeted, uh, hidden Wheel of Time fans among our audience and Fantastical Truth. Do email us with your thoughts about the show, the books, anything to do with Wheel of Time, or the fandom of your choice that's being corrupted by Shadow. You can send an email to podcast at lorehaven.com or tag us on the socials. Just look for Lorehaven on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And once again, of course, go to lorehaven.com, subscribe free, and join the Lorehaven Guild. We're doing our Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe book quest throughout January 2022. But we also have several other channels where you can discuss your favorite stories or whatever is open on your nightstand right now, whatever book is open, which might include the Wheel of Time. So there is your in to share this fandom, uh, even on a server that's devoted toward Christian-made book quests. Next on Fantastical Truth, even when you're doing a smaller podcast like we're doing, you get to meet some famous people, including famous Christians, famous authors. It's a fun perk of the job, how much more so when you're blessed to also attend conferences and engage Christian creators constantly via the interwebs. But this can bring many temptations. Among them, the temptation to treat famous creators as if they are angels or as if they are devils, when of course they are very much human. In the world of fandom by Christians and often for Christians, we will explore how we ought to delight and discern famous creators of stories. Meanwhile, whether you are a Wheel of Time fan or a member of another fandom, 
often disappointed by the ruination of studio executives or TV adaptations, make sure you look forward to the true story. Jesus, the creator, the author of reality, will not disappoint. He will not leave any plot threads unresolved. He will not subvert his own canon, and he will reign over the world that he has made, and we will be forever happy in him, even when our fandoms on this earth disappoint as we continue to seek and find his fantastical truth.